Welcome to the US Asia Law Institute's weekly Asian Law Speaker Program. Today's talk is about uh, public interest and private actors, environmental public interest litigation in China. Our speaker is Dr. Hao Zhuang, whom we are fortunate to have with us this semester at the US Asia Law Institute as a research affiliate. Um, before we begin the program though, I want to draw everyone's attention to next Wednesday's program, which will be about One China and Taiwan's future. Our faculty director emeritus, Jerry Cohen, and Taiwan scholar, uh, Yu Jie Chun, will talk about what the One China policy means in Taiwan and Taiwan's political identity. So environmental public interest litigation is um, a relatively new kind of litigation in China. And it's, um, I just want to note at the outset to avoid confusion that it's very different from US public interest litigation because of who the claimant is. So in the US, we are used to public interest law organizations suing polluters or suing government agencies for failing to stop pollution. And then they uh, hope that their litigation will force some kind of larger change in the regulations or um, you know, in the legal structure. But, um, but the public interest law organization in the US still needs to find a plaintiff who has suffered some harm, who has a direct interest in the litigation. And um, as we will be discussing, that is not the case in China. So our guide to Chinese public interest litigation, uh, Dr. Hao Zhuang has recently completed a PhD in natural resources at Cornell University. Before uh, embarking on the PhD, she worked at or consulted for uh, a number of the leading um, environmental and conservation nonprofit organizations, uh, uh, international organizations in China for uh, nearly two decades. So she speaks not just on the basis of academic research, but her rich experience uh, working with and inside NGOs, and she understands their perspective. Uh, Dr. Zhuang is not a lawyer, but she's very interested in how NGOs use legal tools to achieve their goals. Uh, in the event announcement on our website, we have shared a link to a uh, article that she co-authored recently uh, called EPIL, New Roles for Civil Society Organizations in Environmental Governance in China, which was published in the Journal of Environmental Sociology. So if you haven't seen that yet, I invite you to, to click to the event announcement and you will find the link. Uh, she's working now, uh, another article is forthcoming that's titled Non-Governmental Organizations as Agents of Change in China's Environmental Governance, uh, Opportunity or Serendipity. So now, uh, Dr. Zhuang, uh, I'm gonna give you the mic and we look forward to your presentation. Thank you very much, Catherine. Um, I mean, it's a great pleasure and great honor to, uh, for me to be able to um, uh, have me here and at uh, the US Asia Law Institute to share about my research topics. And uh, yeah, um, I really appreciate for this opportunity. Um, before I uh, started to talk about uh, my uh, research, I first start to share in my screen. It is working, okay. Um, like uh, Catherine has mentioned a little bit, uh, I would like to start uh, with a little bit of my background introduction. That uh, will, um, I mean, the background of myself can explain why I get interested in this public interest litigation and from which angle I'm studying about this issue. Um, I, has been, uh, I has been involved into this conservation work since the year 1999, mainly working with the international conservation organizations. So for the first decades, um, my work is very much related to how to introduce these best uh, conservation practices from elsewhere in the world into the local practice in China. Um, and taking the opportunity to rise up, uh, rose up uh, in 2011, the recent 10 years, uh, I worked with the Windrock International. Uh, there was a project uh, really uh, aimed to foster civil society in China, working in the southwest region of China and Beijing, the NGOs, domestic NGOs. So this opportunity has um, 
uh, helped me to shift my uh, interest from international NGOs into the domestic NGOs. My interest is uh, really to see who are they, the environmental NGOs in China, what they are doing, and how they play a role in the environmental, environmental governance in China. So as a start, I quote a very well-established, very well-known uh, scholar, Peter Ho, who studied uh, the Chinese NGO civil society and green activists in China. 20 years ago, he studied a group of NGOs and green activists and uh, shared this observational conclusion. Uh, according to him, uh, China's model is a green without conflict. The green ac uh, activists and uh, NGOs are profess a female mildness doing the education, I mean, environmental education and cleaning trash from the state park, these so-called kind of soft activities but keep a very safe distance from those politically sensitive topics. So this is a one of his observation. On the other side, he also observed the central government actually keeps an open attitude or kept an open attitude to uh, NGOs uh, actions to comfort uh, with this local state because uh, they feel that uh, this uh, comforting actions can actually help um, help the, uh, the central government to push local government to improve their performance. So after 20 years, uh, what we see, the, we see that uh, in, uh, the domestic NGOs are taking uh, the benefit from the technologies and internet development to use this um, uh, mobile app-based um, blue map things, uh, introduce the citizen scientist concept and uh, cross-sourcing methodology to encourage individual citizens to monitor this uh, environmental misconduct and share those monitoring data into this uh, public accessible mobile uh, app uh, to do the monitoring. And secondly, we see that there are a lot of collective actions happening that people go to the street to fight for the right for clean, care, uh, clean air and clean water, or go to the street to protest Voicing, uh, voicing these objections of the uh, um, chemical factories happening in their neighborhood. We also see that uh, these activist uh, journalists are working hard to openly question the accountability of the, uh, the central government agencies or local government agencies and keep them be responsible for the problems. But through all those activities, we do not see that uh, litigation or law, uh, legal practices are common. Uh, among uh, Chinese NGOs, um, which has happened six and a half years ago, 2015. Um, so before we see uh, the, the policy itself, uh, in one, uh, public, in, public interest in litigation policy first, we see the landscape of uh, the environment law enforcement. Um, in general, government enforcement is a prevailing approach uh, that uh, police, public prosecutor, or government agencies through the administrative approach or criminal laws or criminal litigation or cases to punish those pollut polluters. So from the public uh, private actors, uh, the lawyers representing the individual victims or private business are enforcing the law. But NGO was not very active, um, if not uh, none of them. So I'm wondering uh, and interested to know that uh, how NGOs engagement uh, in this public policy uh, enforcement could contribute to influence the administrative governance in general. Um, the environment public interest litigation, which, which uh, started to be act in 2015, is really based on these two major legislation uh, amendments happening through this uh, uh, period of time, 2012 to 2014. The civil procedure law amendment happened in 12, 12, uh, 2012 identify that entities, organizations can file this public interest litigation. And environmental, law pro uh, environmental protection law uh, amendment in 2014 further specified who exactly can do this uh, litigation. Um, the social organizations who are registered with the Civil, civil Affairs Bureau uh, above the city level more than five years and uh, they need to show that they have been actively involved into the activities related to environmental protection will be uh, possible to be plaintiff to file uh, cases against those pollutants. Um, so after this uh, uh, policy started, uh, we asked what is so special about this uh, litigation uh, 
new litigation practices. First, I would say it is the first time in the history that the law has granted uh, the civil society organization with its legal standings. And secondly, the policy itself is very much focused on the objective to protect the public interest. And uh, from the legal interpretation later uh, issued by SPP, the public has been defined as an unspecified class of people. And like Catherine just uh, mentioned, uh, uh, slightly different from the US system, as NGO uh, uh, in China under this policy does not need to prove this direct interest with, uh, the, uh, with a victim or with a case with the damage. So that leaves a, a greater space for NGOs to rep represent a broader social interest. Uh, during the first 12 months after to, uh, January 2015, we see some rapid uh, policy changes happened immediately. The first uh, uh, lie, the first parallel lie I want to highlight is this administrative litigation. Six months after uh, January 2015, the experiment started to grant exclusive standing right to public prosecutor that only the public prosecutor will be able to sue government agencies for their misconduct or insufficient law enforcement performance. And this experiment has been translated into law by July 2017. And another parallel lie is the system called Environmental Damage Composition System, EEDCS. Uh, under this lie, uh, the government agencies will be, uh, will, uh, has been granted with a standing right to sue the private business or individuals for uh, the environmental misconduct. And if we compare with EEDCS with a civil litigation that NGO can file, you can see that they are suing literally the same type of uh, uh, misconduct and same type of defendant. And this, uh, this system has been experiencing also experimental period. And uh, originally, um, the central government planned to formalize this system in, in law by 2020, which did not happen. And uh, through the last um, uh, couple of years, the cases, the EDCS um, cases filed with the court uh, keeps like a double digit, 20 in uh, 2017, 21 in 2018, and 2010 is 62. So um, by looking at uh, the policy uh, evolution history and also the cases filed by NGOs, I have, the, I have reached these two major observations. Uh, the first uh, observation I would argue that uh, because of the policy itself, uh, especially looking at administrative public in, uh, interest litigation, the policy has helped to re-establish the public prosecutor's judicial supervisory role over the administrative uh, uh, government agencies, which has been lost during the period of uh, 1960s to 1983. Uh, and the second observation is coming from the cases filed by NGOs. I would argue that NGO has been acted as a litigation laboratory, keep bringing these innovative ideas into the court arguing about uh, the new infringement, uh, infringement, the new remedies and methodologies and uh, the way, uh, different ways to protect the environment. So to support my first argument, I would share some statistics with you. I have the uh, uh, statistics uh, starting from uh, 2017 to 2020. I would uh, compare the NGOs cases, super cases, five NGO through the first three years and the cases filed by public prosecutor. We first contrast, contrast the civil uh, cases and administrative cases. So you can see the blue bar representing NGOs cases and uh, the orange bar representing public prosecutors one. Uh, you see the, uh, the different uh, rate of increase. And uh, besides administrative cases, uh, actually, according to the public interest litigation policy, that um, uh, it would cover the food, food and drug safety as one types of uh, uh, litigation besides environmental uh, issues and also the, the uh, public lands and state owned property rights. So if we look at all those topics uh, covered by public interest litigation, then the number of the cases public, pro uh, public prosecutor fight uh, would even increase more. And uh, um, 
uh, if we look at the public prosecutor, actually they can uh, file three types of uh, uh, three types of uh, the litigation: administrative litigation against uh, the uh, government agencies, civil cases they can file, and uh, very commonly seen that a public prosecutor would use the criminal cases as a, a base. And once they find the public interest has been concerned or involved, they could file a new civil cases on top on tops of the criminal cases. So if we look at all types of the litigation cases that the prosecutor can file, the number has been increased even more into the thousands. And uh, another additional information makes uh, the situation more complex is uh, the public prosecutor is using this uh, pre-court uh, pro uh, pro um, uh, procedural uh, recommendation letter for public in interest litigation, which means before the cases uh, reach the courts, um, the public prosecutor can issue this recommendation letter to ad administrative government agencies, either ask them to start working or enforce the law or improve their performance, um, like uh, to uh, enforce the sections they issued but not uh, fulfilled. Um, according to 2020 report from SPP, 90% to 95% of the cases would be solved through this pre-court uh, process. So if we're looking at uh, 2,309 cases, that means uh, it only represents 10% of the cases um, that uh, prosecutors have uh, been handling. Now we uh, turn back to the NGO's case. Um, so uh, NGO keeps bringing those uh, different cases into the court to challenging the innovative ideas and suggest new uh, remedies. I would highlight one case uh, to go a little bit deep, deeper to uh, share some details. Uh, the case is Changzhou Soil Pollution case uh, filed by two organizations, Friends of Nature and uh, China Biodiversity Conservation and uh, Green Development Fund in 2016. They sued three chemical factories that has uh, caused uh, soil pollution during the period of time to four decades. One thing I want to emphasize is through these four decades, the ownership of these factories has been shifted from state owned at the very beginning to later uh, as a private uh, property. And uh, in year 2009, uh, the, these three chemical factories decided to, send, uh, to, to sell this piece of land back to the local government. Uh, local government wanted to develop it as a residential project, um, as, a, as a, a real estate project. But uh, during the first couple of years, they find the, the land is severely polluted. So they decided to start a cleanup uh, project. The project has estimated will cost uh, three and, uh, 370 million RMB. And by uh, the, the public interest that litigation has filed with the court 2016, 95% of the project has been finalized already. Um, and local governments are using the public budget, um, so called, uh, we, we can say it's a tax dollars to pay those clean ops. So that is the issue and the core discussion in the court. These two NGOs are arguing that um, the, all the polluters needs to be liable for this pollution and insist this uh, polluters pay principle. So the, although the clean up project has been paid by the local government, but uh, that is at the price of the society's uh, uh, property, I mean, the, 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 the budget. So um, the NGO insists that uh, the three private companies also needs to pay or pay back to the local government this part of the money. Uh, by the end of uh, 2018, uh, the court judges that uh, judged that two angels win, but in fact, uh, the court did not insist the, the private business will pay back the money to the local government. So to a certain extent, actually the NGO lost this case. And one additional thing I want to mention about this case is Friends of Nature has used the information and the experience accumulated from those cases, similar soil pollution cases, to provide suggestions to the new piece of environmental legislation the Soil Pollution Prevention Law, which was enacted in 2018. Um, the Plutus Pay Principle is one of the core suggestions raised by Friends of Nature. And that uh, principle has, uh, um, to a certain extent, has been integrated into the final version of the law. Um, if we look at, uh, the, in general, all the cases brought by NGOs, we see that the NGO has kept bringing new ideas and remedies in, uh, or ideas to the court. 
like in uh, the preventative litigation cases, NGO is asking the court to, to issue this injunctive relief. And NGO insists that the ecological restoration liability will be a fundamental liability for, for the, uh, such a course. And also the, the, the cost of the uh, ecological restoration needs to be calculated to reflect the real value of the environment or public good. And uh, also NGO has uh, introduced some concept uh, widely used in conservation field, pay for ecosystem services, um, like uh, to, to introduce this concept and uh, apply it in the civil talk dispute. Um, after the judgment, and uh, NGO is emphasizing, we need to make sure there is a long-term monitoring efforts to, uh, to make sure that the environmental output, outputs can be realized. So one of the cases uh, that Franz Major has, in, has been involved uh, successfully set up this environmental trust that uh, invited the professionals to, to manage the fund because traditionally the fund will go to the court and local government and they will uh, oversee the, the use of the, of the fund. Um, and also a multi-stakeholder committee board will be set up under this environmental trust uh, that coming from different directions uh, to have this joint monitoring efforts. And out, out of court and NGO are using and leveraging the power from the media to encourage the public participation uh, into this uh, open debate about what is public, uh, public interest and uh, what is the accountability or liability of uh, government agencies or private business and also the, the experience has been used to influence a new legislation as I have mentioned. Um, and all these efforts are aimed to uh, promote a greater accountability, uh, both for the government agencies and private business. So I have showed some positive perspective of the, of the of picture, but th that does not mean that there's no problems at all. Actually, there are lots of problems observed and uh, that which will lead to future questions for my research interest. First, uh, we started from the NGO part. Um, if we uh, strictly follow the law, uh, the environmental protection law, uh, there would be 7,000 more uh, NGOs could be qualified as a plaintiff. But in practice, uh, there are only 30 organizations uh, existing, I mean, now practicing the litigation. The issue uh, the, I mean, the issue leads to the, the discussion about uh, the capacity of the NGOs, the uh, staff personnel, the fundings, um, and also, uh, I mean, the, the coordinations among the NGOs would be a question. And in recent years, there are scholars started to study the effectiveness of the cases that uh, has filed uh, from uh, the, uh, by the NGOs and questioning whether the NGOs are selecting the right type of cases to address the most severe or most um, uh, important urgent environmental issues. Some of the conclusion are negative, it's not very positive. So that leads me to ask a question, what should be the right legal strategies of NGOs um, or as an NGO sector? Um, so, um, at the se second perspective, I, I'm really very interested about this public and private actors uh, relationship. Uh, if we make it uh, more broader, it's a uh, question in the state society dynamic. So from the previous statistics, we see that uh, there definitely are increasing numbers of the law enforcement actions happening. But um, we question whether the public actor and the private actor are, cooperation are cooperating together. Can they complement each other? Um, whether, I mean, they should collaborate for more and how to collaborate. And also uh, I contrast uh, the, the civil litigations and EDCS system. So there seems there is a competition among this government agency and, uh, and the NGOs. So whether the competition is real, sure, uh, should they compete? Or uh, the further question to ask is whether the state is simply want to use uh, NGOs to I mean, address those uh, issues or pu punish those defendants, uh, those polluters that the state does not want to touch or does not have enough or sufficient uh, resources to touch. So maybe I will uh, just uh, uh, stop there. Um, stop my yeah, sharing and uh, looking forward to the, the questions and discussions afterwards. Yeah. Thank you very much for your attention.
So thank you very much. That was a great overview. And um, you've already teed up uh, quite a few questions that I want to throw back at you now for deeper <laughs> discussion. Um, the first thing I want to ask is what environmental uh, public interest litigation brings to the picture um, that might be more effective you know, than what we had before. So as you said, the prosecutors can file criminal charges and they do. Um, and the Environmental Protection Agency can and, and does increasingly impose administrative fines, penalties on polluters. Um, but those tools haven't seemed to work very well in the sense that when I say that they don't work, um, I mean, in, a, in the larger picture, they haven't deterred pollution and there's just massive environmental uh, pollution uh, and damage, ecological damage going on across the country. So does environmental public interest litigation uh, by comparison, is it more effective in actually achieving compliance? Um, so in, in the broader picture, as opposed to getting some kind of um, uh, damages from the polluter in the immediate case that is being sued over, does it have, does it, does it change the overall picture of improving compliance? Or is that too much to expect? Is it just adding another tool so that now you have more tools for achieving compliance? Mm. Um, yeah, that's a that's a really great uh, and valid question. I would uh, I would say, I mean, uh, if we are going to discuss about the effectiveness, I would say that needs some time to really uh, test and measure and evaluate uh, what uh, the effectiveness would mean. But um, definitely, I mean, uh, this policy has started six and a half year ago, and people are still kind of exploring what is possible especially from uh, the NGOs. I think uh, from the public actors perspective also, they, they are exploring the boundaries, what is possible, what is acceptable, and what is not, uh, I mean, what is uh, safe without yes. causing the, uh, I mean, on, uh, the, the worries from, uh, from the state. Um, so, but uh, the effectiveness needs to be measured. And I see, uh, as I mentioned in my, in my slides, some of the scholars already started to do this research and published some, some uh, works. And um, the conclusion is, the effectiveness is no. The argument of one of the articles are saying that the government is uh, providing the strong enough and uh, very effective enforcement already. So NGO does not bring any additional kind of value. So for this argument, I personally do not agree <laughs> because it's clear that uh, you want to, issues are becoming more and more severe and uh, definitely the public enforcement is not sufficient. And that's why we need uh, uh, new tools to address these issues. But one thing I want to emphasize is um, the, the good thing about the policy is it brings uh, new actors into the game. And I used to say it's a cat of, uh, catfish, the sucker mouse catfish into a fish tank. <laughs> so it uh, stirred uh, the, the rule of the game and bring new fresh air and what, what you need to see. And also benefiting from the, this info, information disclosure law and also uh, leveraging the power of the media and social media that NGO can use the cases to stimulate this public debate or public discussion. So I see that is the added value I mean, from NGO. Uh, and, um, and another perspective I see from the positive side is NGO's cases are reflecting different perspectives of different types of the cases. For instance, the preventative litigation, which was not uh, commonly seen in the past. Like uh, if we talk about administrative of the environmental protection, the old name of the MEE, the major mandate is to reduce the pollution and control the pollution from the end. But preventative litigation is a new types of litigation to say that, hi, hey, we need to stop the project be before it uh, can create uh, in e a reversible uh, ecological damage. So that is really new. So the new ideas, new issues, 
Uh, and uh, the Changzhou case, as I mentioned, is uh, really openly questioning this state market relationship. That is new types of uh, questions that uh, we do not see the traditional government enforcement would question. So mm -hmm. I would say from that perspective, there are some new things happening, but it's a, uh, it is a, a little bit too early for us to uh, make a conclusion that is more effective than before. Because that, uh, especially if we are talking about the environmental outcomes, that takes time to really monitor. First, we need to have the database, and we need to have uh, 10 years, uh, five to 10 years to observe the improvement or, uh, I mean, degradation of the environment. And then we can have a conclusion of the environmental outcome. So, right. Yeah. So, you mentioned that there's already um, quite a bit of research going on about um, impact and outcomes. Have has any of this research looked at, uh, or have you looked at, the success rates of litigation? So, one one might assume um, or guess that um, the success rates would be somewhat higher if the public interest litigation is being brought by the prosecutors, by the procuratorate, than yeah. by a private actor, just because they are a uh, part of the government. A, their authority, their, um, their relationships with courts, um, and also their greater resources. Um, do, do you know, is it known yet, what the comparative success rates of public interest litigation are between the cases brought by NGOs and the cases brought by the prosecutors? Uh, uh, yeah, uh, yes, there are statistics, uh, statistics that are available about the public prosecutors' uh, uh, cases, and, uh, but there's uh, not yet the, the, the statistics uh, related to uh, the NGO's case. And um, most of the, I mean, uh, let me put it in this way, most of the cases filed by public, uh, public prosecutors would be endorsed by the court, most of the majority. But NGO's case, um, uh, I think the story has two sides. One thing is you need to be able to success, successfully file the cases with the court. So that mm -hmm. is one part. <laughs> Some of the cases ca cannot reach this stage yet. And um, the cases takes a long time for NGOs. For instance, uh, the, the NGO I'm, I worked with uh, more closely, the Friends of Nature, the first uh, the, uh, public litigation case they filed is back in 2011. And the case has been closed uh, this year. So you see, the averagely one case NGO filed uh, will take like two to four years to, to get to, to reach the, 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 uh, the final ruling from the court. That is the whole process. Um, and the rate, uh, I mean, uh, I do, uh, yeah, I do not have the status with the NGOs, but I, I see the difficulties through the whole process that NGO has to has has to struggle in <laughs> to get um, to get the ruling, to provide the investigation, to raise funds to do the investigation, and also, I mean, to keep yourself through this four years working with the NGO to wait for mm -hmm. the court judge. Yeah. Mm, right. What, what about um, comparisons on size of damages or awards that the courts issue, whether the plaintiff is the procuratorate or the plaintiff is a, uh, an NGO? Has that mm. comparison been done? Has that data been collected? Yeah, there is one piece of paper I would uh, uh, recommend. It's uh, Xu Lu and, uh, uh, Xu Lu and Xie Lei, uh, published uh, this year. They really looked into the study, I mean, uh, the cases filed by NGO, looking at the size of the plan, uh, size of the, the defendant and mm -hmm. of the uh, environmental uh, issues uh, that mm -hmm. they addressed. Uh, the, and they kind of contrasted with uh, the public uh, actors, um, like uh, the similar types, uh, similar types of litigation filed by public pro uh, prosecutor. And the conclusion from that paper is that uh, uh, the question that NGO could choose bigger, uh, like a bigger scale of the, the, the defendant private business and uh, more serious environmental uh, issues to, to, to sue because the public prosecutor definitely is uh, suing the bigger defendant and uh, asking for more uh, uh, about uh, 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 the composition, the amount of the composition. So that, 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 
that uh, statistics uh, supported their argument to say that NGO is not bringing the additional uh, value to the oh, law I enforcement. See. <laughs> so, so they're among the naysayers. Right, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Right. But they, they bring a lot of uh, uh, detailed uh, statistics that is a very good um, yeah, uh, study. So that's interesting. Um, it's not surprising, but you're saying that the public prosecutors are asking for more in damages and, and getting more in damages. I had had the impression that some of the NGO cases were among the largest um, uh, awards ever given. Uh, so I'm thinking, for example, of the Tengar desert sewage pollution case in um, Inner Mongolia, where actually there wasn't a court award, but there was a settlement, um, which I was in the neighborhood of 90 million US dollars, uh, or a little more than that. Um, which at the time was praised as being quite large. Um, so is, is, is my understanding out of date? Uh, have the prosecutors uh, gotten moved in the direction of getting larger um, sums of money? Or is it just individual cases that hit the headlines and get attention? Yes, uh, I mean, at the very beginning, uh, the first uh, couple of uh, two years, that uh, NGOs are filing some very influential uh, individual cases. Uh, the the Tungar case you have mentioned uh, is based on some um, uh, criminal, local scale criminal cases that has been handled uh, in year 2014. But in year 2015, that uh, NGO filed these public litigation cases and resulted in the, the mediation of, uh, I think it's uh, around, uh, I mean, it's uh, 83 million US dollars um, as a final result. And if we compare with uh, the criminal cases, the final uh, result, uh, the court ruling, it's almost 100 times bigger than the criminal mm. cases. This is uh, one of the case. Um, and also uh, the Changzhou case also has claimed three point, I mean, uh, in RMB, um, 370 million as a, as a claim. But uh, the, at the last, the court did not really support this uh, claim. Um, so those cases are making really kind of a, a landmark case mm -hmm. to show a very um, radical, proactive um, reactions from, from the NGO. But um, in the later years, you're right that the public prosecutor, especially at the local level, are seeking for those uh, bigger amounts of the compensation to claim you know, to sue. So relatively in the later years, um, these differences are not uh, as big as uh, uh, at the very beginning. Right, that's interesting. So could you tell a little bit more about the Tengar Desert case? Because it had a lot of really interesting facets to it. It, was a, it, was, it went on for a long time and there was this interesting intervention by the Supreme People's Court. Can, can you maybe tell us that story? Oh, yeah, sure. Tungar case uh, is uh, about um, uh, eight chemical com companies uh, keep um, discharging this untreated wasted water into a desert in, Mongol in Mongolia area. And because desert is, uh, uh, there's no human living there, so they, uh, it did not catch a lot of attention till the media reported uh, in, back in 2015 and 2014. So local court has filed some criminal cases to punish individual or uh, one of the factories has been sued to pay for the compensation, I mean, restore, I mean, uh, to, to pay for the environmental damage. That mm -hmm. is the first beginning. But later this case, also because the media's, uh, uh, media's report has reached uh, she, uh, Chairman Xi, so attention. Mm. And then there is an inspection mission has been formed from the central government to go to the field to invest what is going on and whether the local government is fulfilled, uh, was for, for fulfilling their mandate to enforce the environmental law. So since, since that period of time, uh, the case has re received a lot of tensions either from the society, either from the government or prosecutor. Um, the, uh, the organization China Biodiversity Conservation and the Green Development Fund uh, filed this litigation in 2015. Actually, it experienced some uh, kind of turbulence. The first, first two rounds, actually, the court denied the case because uh, they argued that uh, this organization was not qualified to be plaintiff. And also, it's understandable because it's at the very beginning of the policy, so nobody really 
uh, very clear, it was really clear who needs to be qualified, what kind of uh, I mean, procedures they, they, they needed to go through. So at last uh, uh, story, uh, in short, um, the NGO appealed to the uh, SPC to ask for the plaintiff right. So uh, the SPC ruled that uh, the NGO can be qualified as plaintiff. So the, the case has been filed. And uh, the case itself has experienced two years uh, of the negotiation discussion and mediated at the end. Um, one thing is really uh, kind of emphasize the desert, although there's no, seems that, that no mm, plants, <laughs> no water, but still, I mean, representing or carrying certain level of value because it's a mm -hmm. public good. And uh, another thing about this case I want to mention is this case has been listed as, uh, uh, by SPC as a China judicial guide, guiding cases, the number uh, 75 which is the first NGO case has been filed on this list. And as you may know, this judicial guiding case carries uh, legal nature. So uh, China does not have the precedent system, but the guiding case uh, acted uh, de facto as a pre precedent to, to guide local court's judgment. So that is influential. Let me ask, do you um, have any uh, information on why the Supreme People's Court took such a supportive position. I don't mean uh, in its, on, on the law, on the actual legal merits, but by deciding that the definition of which NGOs could qualify to be plaintiffs, by saying we should take a more uh, relaxed or uh, a, a, a larger uh, scope for definition, be more inclusive in who can file these cases, as opposed to what the lower court was doing, which was saying, uh, if your uh, articles of incorporation, if your, your mission statement doesn't include, you know, you weren't registered to do this kind of thing to pursue uh, these public interest cases, then we're not going to say that we're, we're going to decide you're not qualified to do it. Why, what was the motivation for the Supreme People's Court to take that approach and effectively open the court doors wider to nonprofits when normally we see the courts um, trying to keep the, the doors a little bit more closed because they're always worried about um, more cases, right? They're always <laughs> saying they're we, we already have too many cases. We are exactly, we are overwhelmed with the caseload. We don't want to encourage people to come to us. And um, so this time they did the opposite. Do you have any uh, understanding insights of to what they may have been thinking? Mm. Uh, I mean, one, one of the thing I'm thinking is that um, the, uh, in 2015, actually the, the policy just started. So no one was really clear what exactly it means. I mean, although the law has saying that uh, the social organizations registered with uh, uh, the super, uh, super affair bureaus above city level for five years and doing environment activities could be qualified. But like uh, the in Tungur case, people has checked the NGO's registration paper to make sure that you are involved into the environmental activities. And uh, the, you know the fact that you worked in China for years, for many years, you know that when you register, you want to, you're trying to fill more information into the scope of work <laughs> that can leave more space for you to work in the future. So that is the process that people are really kind of start looking at details that who exactly or, or how we measure those, uh, those status or, or the qualification and to make sure that to decide who can be qualified as a plaintiff. Um, my my uh, feeling is that uh, SPC has been uh, involved, has involved very actively also because that's the start of the policy. Mm -hmm. um, so every, every now that uh, the new thing started the central government would uh, show the, uh, uh, the extra supportive or extra energy to to make the policy working. So that is one of the of the assumptions that uh, SPC has been has has acted very um, actively to do. And another uh, thinking is uh, because this case has reached the Xi's attention, mm -hmm. that uh, has brought the case into another level. Um, like uh, like uh, I mentioned, the uh, special inspection mission has been set up from the central government to uh, mm -hmm. investigate this case in particular. Uh, that happens before 
um, before the litigation, the, the public uh, interest litigation happened. So. Right, and that that actually complicates the story quite a bit, I think, doesn't it? Because if we yeah. want to do an analysis of the the role that the NGOs are playing and what value they add, yeah, exactly. um, if the cases they take in some way have been already put mm. on the government agenda for attention, yeah, yeah exactly. Then you have to ask a question about what they what they're bringing. Um, I see a lot of questions already in the queue, so I just want to ask one last thing before I start taking some of those questions from the audience, and that is about um, how much work the the environmental NGO community now is doing to uh, increase its own capacities to engage in this kind of litigation. I remember in two thousand and. Uh, 12, when the um, civil procedure law was amended and we first saw that language that you highlighted saying that public interest litigation uh, could take place when it, when it basically created the, the space for this new kind of litigation, not exclusively on the environment, but at that time there was a huge amount of excitement about the possibilities of public interest litigation of NGOs and others um, becoming more active players in this way in shaping uh, regulatory policies. And then 20, 2015 with the environmental protection law further elaborating on this and making very clear that there was a role for them to play. Tremendous excitement. A lot of training workshops were held. Uh, different NGOs uh, had projects where they were trying to uh, assist NGOs in networking with lawyers and assist yeah. lawyers in identifying NGOs that they wanted to work with, sort of a matchmaking type activity, yep. because of a um, of a, a sense that most NGOs, including the environmental ones, didn't know much about law. They very few of them actually had lawyers on their own staff, or even had long-standing relationships with lawyers. You know, they didn't necessarily know any lawyers. Uh, and they were nervous of litigation because there was a sense that it could be very dangerous to yep. get involved in litigation. You could be accused of being a troublemaker, mm. particularly yeah. by your local uh, regulatory uh, structure that the NGOs themselves have to mm. be accountable to. So there was a lot of nervousness, a lot of uncertainty and very little capacity. So there was a lot of, there were trainings going on. There were these networking activities uh, to introduce lawyers and NGOs and generally raise the level across all of the organizations. Um, but in fact, since 2015, it's really been a handful of NGOs that have brought these cases. Um, and the, the sector as a whole does not seem from afar to have really gained much in the way of legal capacity. So I'm, could you talk a little bit about what might be going on now in terms of uh, capacity building or interest, or has the um, ha has the sector sort of fallen into a, a, a pattern where these few NGOs are the ones who play this particular role, and the rest of us carry on with what you described as this more mild um, <laughs> and and cooperative approach of you know working with okay, government yeah. and you know cleaning up the litter and educating mm -hmm. children about the value of the environment and those other kinds of softer roles mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah definitely you raised uh, some really critical and valid questions uh, i mean about uh, the capacity of ngos uh, so I, I think there are two perspectives one is ngos capacity uh, it's true that internally the ngos are struggling to get this capacity. One is um, not only the, um, uh, the attorney stuff, the personnel perspective, like you need to hire uh, the people who knows law and interested in the environment and also interested or uh, know the um, environment of working as a civil society organization in China. This mm -hmm. is the first one, the, the requirement about individuals. And there are requirements for institutional capacity because you need to know, you need to be experienced enough to know that uh, when is opportunity, I mean, political opportunity arise mm -hmm. and how you seize those opportunities to act. Um, and also fundraising is, uh, seems like a forever uh, challenge for, <laughs> for NGOs working in China and how to keep those uh, staff working with you for a relatively stable period of time. 
And uh, you've you have mentioned there are lots of uh, training programs going on. Started uh, even can be traced back in 2004. Uh, ABA, NRDC, and the uh, Vermont Law School uh, has, one, has been one of them to really kind of uh, um, helping the organizations not only uh, to, to increase individuals' capacity, but also trying to encourage them to set up a network supporting each other. Uh, so th this is uh, all valid, uh, I mean, questions that NGO needs to solve. Um, but on the other side, I would say that NGO needs to think about um, what is the strategy, whether we need um, like hundreds of uh, NGOs to mm. be litigation NGO in China. How many do we need in this country? And mm -hmm. <laughs> this is a kind of very rough question, but it's worth to think, uh, what is the strategy? I mean, by collaboration together, um, uh, I, I go a little bit further to say, it's not to say we have the labor division, you do the environmental education, I do litigation, but by doing litigation, we need different types of capacity and resources to be invested. For instance, some of the organizations can be specialized into the investigation to collect mm -hmm. evidence, to do the monitoring, uh, to understand the environmental issues, to provide technical kind of support so those, um, uh, or to advocate, to mm -hmm. arrange data, right? So those uh, capacities could be existing already among different types of NGO, whether they can cooperate together. This is the dream. I mean, <laughs> this is uh, the, the expectation or dream we had uh, to say that if we set up a network, whether it's mm -hmm. not only to do the lawyer, I mean, uh, the legal thing, but mm -hmm. um, uh, look at the issue as uh, an uh, integrated perspective. That cooperation. Can, yeah, yeah cooperation. cooperation. Not just to litigate, you're saying, just cooperate right. generally to have a shared strategy. Right, right. And the strategy is whether litigation is the only option or litigation can contribute it to an uh, ultimate goal a little bit further. I mean, influence the legislation, mm -hmm. influence the policy whether that can bring some impact. I mean, it's a, 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 we talk about effectiveness. So that's why I, I say that when we are talking about effectiveness, we need to think more about how we define the effectiveness, whether it's a mm -hmm. environmental effectiveness, whether it's a, the winning case, winning a percentage of the winning case uh, with the court or some other impact, social or societal impact. Of course, we can go even further. I mean, this public debate, about uh, public interest and liability and accountability issue in the society, whether that can be regarded as part of the impact or effectiveness to be considered. So those are the questions here yeah, could be asked. Right, right. Yeah. So uh, the first question I want to raise from the queue is a request for a point of clarification. So in, mm -hmm. your, in your presentation, you mentioned that there had been a change in the law in uh, 2017 that limited uh, what NGOs could do. So is the request for clarification whether this 2017 legislation limited the environmental litigation against the government to public prosecutors? And um, so I think the answer there is yes, right? That um, yeah. this public interest litigation could be against uh, the polluter. Yeah. But it also could be against a government agency for failing to enforce the environmental laws. Yeah. And initially the NGOs were told they could do both, but then yeah. from 2017, they were told, no, you can only sue other Party, private parties. Yeah. parties. Okay. Yeah, not and the so government that, agencies. The government, the suing the government was restricted to the prosecutors. And now, now under the new, mm. you spoke of this other type of litigation, um, environmental damage compensation. Yeah, um, EDCS, yeah. This, this ex Bans the the um, the range of plaintiffs yet further to say uh, it's not just the prosecutors. The Environmental Protection Agency itself could bring a public interest claim. Yeah. Is that yeah. right? Civil litigations. Yes, EEDCS allows government agencies, administrative government agencies who are in charge of environmental issues, to sue uh, individuals and private businesses um, for mm -hmm. their uh, environmental misconduct. So not not government a, agencies now. No, no, no. no. Government okay. agencies as a defendant can be only sued by the public prosecutor. 
But um, that raised a question like, uh, um, at the very beginning, the first uh, the six months, uh, the, the expectation is NGO can openly question um, the accountability of government agencies. Mm -hmm. If the administrative, uh, I mean, if the administrative litigation could be covered, um, it, yeah, uh, for, for NGOs. But uh, uh, you're right, in 2017, by law, uh, July 1st, mm -hmm. 2017, no uh, NGO no longer could sue government agencies. Mm -hmm. the exclusive uh, standing right. Right. So an uh, excellent question here asks, um, could you say a bit more about how public interest is defined in China? Um, um, does, does it align with state assets? So is it about the assets that are harmed or is it more aligned with socialist values? Mm -hmm. uh, public interest, uh, no, first, uh, uh, public is defined as an uh, unspecified group of people. This is the first uh, layer of, uh, of meaning. And public mm -hmm. re interest litigation literally covers uh, like environmental issues, uh, so environmental resources, uh, en environment and natural resources, and uh, uh, covers the drugs and food safety. So that is uh, the, uh, the issues has a direct uh, impact with the uh, with the general public, drugs and food safety. And also the, the uh, um, public land. Mm -hmm. And another special issue I want to mention, which is a kind of a different is uh, the state owned properties. Um, because uh, I mean, in the past, there were uh, some cases happened that uh, the state owned properties has been uh, changed the ownership into the private property. So that is the loss. Uh, for the for the country, uh, that also regarded uh, related to the public interest, so can uh, will be covered by this policy. So, so there are certain topical areas or subject areas that have been deemed to be eligible to be the subject of public interest litigation, but but those same subject areas, for example, the environment or food and drugs, you could also have a private tort claim, right? Mm, so. Yeah. So a farmer could sue uh, a local factory uh, yeah. just as a private litigation to say, this factory's pollution damaged my crop. Here's the proof of damage and I'm looking for compensation from the factory. And that's not a public interest case. Mm -hmm. So in addition to the subject matter definition, has the law made clear or have courts made clear how they want to draw the line between when a claim actually invokes the public interest, or is it sufficient to say the environment has been damaged, anything that damages the environment is a matter of public interest, even if it's just this farmer's crops, does that automatically become eligible to be a public interest case? Or does there have to be something bigger about the damage uh, or the nature? Uh, to my best of knowledge, uh, I mean, uh, the public interest litigation does not deny the tort case. So mm -hmm. the, the private uh, litigation can still go on. So it does not mean that cannot happen. It's still there. They are still there. Um, and um, uh, the, the public interest litigation is very much depend on whether you have the plaintiff to raise it, uh, to file it as a litigation, to file the case. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, I know that there are um, many cases still existing uh, as a tort case or private interest litigation, uh, which is not brought as a, a public in interest type, uh, right. not because it, it does not relate it to public interest, but uh, it's more depends on whether there are NGOs that uh, know about this case and uh, are willing to file it as a public interest litigation. Mm. Because sometimes, for instance, uh, the soil pollution I mean, um, the, the first case, the Friends of Nature filed, it started with this individual. I mean, the private individuals that they feel their farmland has been polluted. So they sue the company. So that is very much as a private interest litigation. I mean, the, the, the tort, yeah, right. Mm -hmm. But um, it was there for a while until Friends of Nature filed it as a public litigation later. So that's very much depends on whether you find a plaintiff who is willing and able to bring it up as a public litigation. And that plaintiff doesn't need to make an argument about larger impact. 
So for example, I'm not sure which soil litigation case you mean, but in the Chaozhou case that you talked about, um, the public purse was affected because the local government was spending public money to yeah. clean up the soil. And so I could imagine an argument being made that this does not just affect um, future persons who might live on that polluted soil or yeah. neighbors or anything like that, who actually suffer the direct impacts of the pollution, but that the argument I would think could be made that everybody in Chaojo is affected because our tax dollars are being used to clean up the soil. Um, mm -hmm. So wh what I think you're saying is it, it doesn't, there isn't a need to make that argument about a wider impact on the public. Mm. I mean, uh, France Nature, uh, if we use the case, uh, Changzhou case as an example, France Nature has to demonstrate the damage uh, as related to public interest. That's true. Mm -hmm. oh, right. Yeah. Right. Um, mm. But uh, if I understood that correctly, but, uh, that means France Nature filed this case does not deny or stop individuals to file their own cases to, sure. to sue the, the factories. Yeah. Sure. No, that we understand. It's just a question of what the bar is for public interest, because certainly that could be contested quite a bit. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if you have to show that that other element. Um, so there's an excellent question from Frank Upham about what the role is of local protectionism in public interest litigation, whether the case is brought by an NGO or by uh, prosecutors. Um, does local protectionism enter into these cases uh, as we know it can in other kinds of litigation? Mm. Uh, I mean, uh, if, uh, yeah, from my understanding of this question, uh, it's an excellent question. Uh, yes, there are uh, not, not to say local protectionism. From the uh, NGO's perspective, I know that uh, there is a discussion that NGO would ask their fellow NGOs to file the litigation happens in his or her homeland, uh, home hometown, just to, trying to avoid the conflict. Because uh, if an uh, NGO is registered in one city and uh, uh, she or he keeps bringing litigations against the local private business or local government, uh, local private business that can bring him some trouble. So in this case, uh, the NGOs would ask the fellow NGOs in other city to help them to file the cases. This is one. It's another way around <laughs> from the NGOs perspective. And uh, from public prosecutors uh, perspective, um, I do not, to my best knowledge, I do not see there are lots of concerns also because uh, the administrative uh, PIL really give the, the, the right to the public prosecutor like to say you need to improve your law enforcement supervisory role mm -hmm. to file the cases. Uh, in fact, there is a kind of quota system existing within the public prosecutor. Like within one year, you need to file a certain number of cases to kind of one chen yeah. do, do you, is, is it known how many cases there are, they are being required to file? Do you have any more information um, about what that yeah. this? Yeah, this is a this is a very um, I mean challenging question that people uh, do not really share with you. They just uh, mention that uh, there is a um, right, but an they rather yeah they'd rather not uh, to talk with you very openly. Right. <laughs> but but then that would suggest if that's the case that pretty much every procuratorate office across China should be filing these cases. Are they or I are oh. or are we seeing instead that it's the certain offices in certain parts of the country that are doing most or all of this public interest litigation? Um, for the first uh, couple of years, starting from 2007, I see that the uh, public prosecutor acted really very uh, proactive to do things. But these two years, you also from the statistics, you see that um, it's, a, um, I mean, the, the line is going uh, slowly, I mean, uh, calm up. Um, and also, one thing I would say that one way to, um, I mean, to, to respond to the original question, one way to explain also is this pre court um, uh, rec uh, recommendation, prosecutor recommendation letter. I mean, this is a very widely used approach. Uh, before go to the court, they would issue, the public prosecutor would issue this recommendation letter to urge the administrative government agencies to improve their performance. 
So 90% has been solved in this one, in this uh, pr process without creating conflicts. So basically, this, is, this a, is a warning. This is a warning letter saying, if you don't take yeah. action, we will sue. Yeah, yeah, it's a warning. And uh, this letter normally will give a certain period of time, depends on the, uh, the cases, that within the limited time, you need to improve your performance. And you need to provide the plans and also evidence to say that you, I have done extra work. And 90 to 90%, 95% of the cases has been solved. So then on the other side, you see that it's not, um, I mean, a lot of information has been resolved through mm -hmm. this process, right. uh, which is not open to the public. So uh, if we are talking about uh, 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 the administrative government agency's performance, Mm -hmm. uh, some issues has been embedded in this process that we will, can we can we know. find statistics about those letters how many of those letters are issued can we find yeah. that in the annual report of the yeah. uh, supreme people's procuratorate to the national people's congress do they yeah. include that yeah uh, in 2020 um uh, the spp's report uh are reporting there were 130,000 cases are resolved letters <laughs> Letters. Yeah, letter. Okay. Let, uh, the, uh, or resolved by resolved, resolved by this pre-court uh, process. Yeah. yeah, even That's... more letters. Yeah, but the cases. Mm -hmm. But I still want to go back to to uh, Professor Uppen's original question because it seems a bit incredible that um, local protectionism would not be a major obstacle to this because it has always been the obstacle to environmental protection in tension with economic development, right? Yes, so definitely. the local government obviously wants to get more tax revenue and it wants to create jobs and economic mm. development is the way to do that. Mm. Um, and some economic development is going to be polluting and therefore, uh, and the, the local procuratorate office is funded by, or actually there's been a reform yeah, exactly. there, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they have been funded, they've been appointed by and controlled by the local government. And so mm -hmm. if the local government's mission is economic development, and if local officials are promoted on the basis of their achievements in economic development, then this tends to discourage enforcement of environmental law. Mm -hmm. So are we seeing here playing out a new uh, policy that we've heard talked about, but are we actually seeing now the implementation of this new emphasis on balancing development with environmental protection and is this does the fact that these procuratorates have quotas for how many of these uh, actions they should take every year does that indicate that there's higher level support for this which overcomes local protectionism mm -mm. definitely there are two two things one thing is uh, the general policy environment nowadays in China is very much emphasizing environmental protection. That explains the central pressure from, from, from Beijing has given the local government uh, to say that we need to pay more attention to the environment quality and also uh, the, 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 the environment uh, uh, health. health. Um, so this is one, one way to explain why the local government are more, uh, are accepting more the, the environmental related uh, policies and, uh, and the actions rather than promoting the local economic development. Um, and, uh, and now as, uh, as I know that I'm interested in another uh, thing is about this uh, green development index, um, mm -hmm. a, new a new system developing to emphasize, uh, I mean, the, the local uh, government cedar's performance will be evaluated not only considering the local economic development, but also the environment quality. So this is a trend that happened in China, the environment is getting more and more uh, important. Yeah, this is one thing. And the second line I would like to emphasize is still this pro-court uh, uh, recommendation process. Uh, actually, from my perspective, I see it has been helped the, the public prosecutor to avoid a lot of conflict. Uh, rather the, the than warning letters, right? Wrong warning letters, rather than go to the court or uh, I mean, uh, make it legal, but right. using this um, so-called softer, I mean, approach to solve the problem. Of course, the argument is that it can save this process can save the limited judicial resources. I mean, that makes sense somehow. Yeah, but uh, still, right. yeah. Right. So, um, Professor Jose Alvarez asks about. Um, 
other resources that could be used to, to uh, compensate for the uh, shortcomings of NGOs uh, in terms of their capacities. NGOs, as you said, have personnel limitations, they have funding limitations, but in, in the US where NGOs have the same challenges, um, exactly the same, um, there, is, uh, there are some other resources that come in such as public interest clinics in law schools. Mm -mm. Yeah. And certainly Chinese law schools have uh, legal clinics for the last 20 yeah. years, uh, and some of them do focus on environment. Could you talk a bit about the role that they might be playing? Yeah, actually, the uh, NGO sector has been working very closely with those clinics, and also especially from uh, Professor Wang Tanfa. Uh, mm -hmm. he, he has this uh, uh, NGO he established years ago, Clap V, has been working as a co-plaintive for many cases together, standing together with the NGOs. So this collaboration is keeping on. But as far as I know, the clinic has a problem is that you have these volunteer lawyers sitting in the clinic to provide services. Sometimes the students come and go. So the stability is one of the issue that NGO needs to consider. Another way, another approach I know that NGO is trying is to uh, experiment to establish the relationship with law firm. The mm -hmm. pro bono system are existing in the law firm and also some individual lawyers would be very much interested in practicing the amount of, uh, I mean, public interest litigation. As I know, uh, some of the name, I am sure you will you know, they, they even started their own, own NGO uh, this year, very recently, mm -hmm. <laughs> to kind of uh, devote it to, the, to these efforts. Um, so yeah, one of the, the program I know uh, uh, is trying to um, cultivate individual lawyers by provide fundings. I mean, from EU sources, from US sources, provide uh, the salary fundings to young junior lawyers working mm -hmm. inside of the NGOs. Uh, like they pay the salary and uh, the resources to support them to do the investigation and uh, uh, the court uh, court practices, and hoping that uh, this stuff, uh, this yeah, junior lawyers, uh, can stay inside of the NGO, or even they move to the law firms, they can continue this collaboration relationship with the host NGOs they worked with. So it's right. more like expanding the uh, uh, sources uh, of the of the of the stuff that that NGO can look at. Right. Yeah. These are these are a little bit. Uh, like the Scadden Fellows, um, these fellowship type programs. Um, good question. And the second question that uh, Professor Alvarez raises is about the political risks. Um, and uh, we certainly have seen environmental activists in China be arrested um, and do jail time, be accused of various crimes, sometimes connected with their environmental activism, sometimes not connected with their environmental activism. Um, and the entire uh, nonprofit sector right now has been feeling a chill for the last few years uh, as part of a uh, sort of society-wide um, movement by from the top leadership of the party to increase party control over every aspect of society um, that uh, as, as the expression went that the party should be leading everything, you know, north, south, east, and west, everywhere, we should be seeing the leadership of the party. Mm. And so there's always the risk then that an NGO can get too far out ahead of the leadership of the party um, and suddenly find itself at the front of the parade where all the attention is on it and it's not comfortable. Um, so do you see the, um, the, this chill, this political environment of everybody taking a back seat to party leadership, not moving forward um, to initiate, but to follow. Do you see this environment, this uh, atmosphere changing the way that en environmental NGOs are strategizing and uh, discouraging them from handling public interest litigation or having other effects on their, on their activities? 
Uh, yes, uh, like uh, the second piece of the publication I'm working on is exactly talking about this issue. I mean, of mm -hmm. this political environment, uh, ever-changing policy environment, as uh, as the the, the, the issue that NGO has to face in China. Mm -hmm. I mean, not only for this year, this year is definitely narrowing down and constraining, uh, but uh, starting from the very beginning, it is the case. Um, um, yes, for this uh, couple of years that NGO are feeling uh, more and more pressure to practice uh, their, 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 their programs or activities, um, but um, one thing I ask also because my background is coming from NGO, so I have uh, this perspective um, mm. to, uh, as an NGO. That one thing we ask ourselves is whether uh, we should um, insist on the ultimate uh, goal or mission that we set up at the very beginning. So by by being called as an NGO, actually as a civil society organization, somehow our mission is representing the societal's interest and speak up for them. So if this is ultimate goal, um, and we need to really kind of uh, being adaptive and being uh, strategic to, to see what we can do. Um, I mean, uh, litigation, one of the arguments I have in this article is uh, litigation is one of the way that NGO trying to explore by being uh, more professional, more technical oriented, and set up the reputation in the specific expertise, uh, expertise um, and also showing the credentials that I have done such and such uh, to build up the reputation among the, the constituencies, I mean, among the members or, or the individuals uh, and in front of the government agencies, because in fact, some of the cases filed by NGOs are helping the local government to address the issues. So by doing that, um, we, uh, I mean, as we, meaning NGO, are trying to uh, build up a complementary mm -hmm. uh, relationship with, uh, with, uh, with the state. This is the hope, this is mm -hmm. the dream, right? Mm -hmm. But we do, like you said, we do face the challenges uh, to say that whether that can be done, <laughs> whether that is allowed. <laughs> Uh, for us to do that, right? Right. Um, Can you give an example of how NGOs have cooperated behind the scenes to take on some of this kind of litigation? Because my, I've heard some stories about how before an NGO files a particular public interest litigation, they have extensive conversations, private conversations with various government actors and agencies to make sure that the government agencies know they're going to do this <laughs> in other words, they don't they don't surprise them with it, yep. right? Mm -hmm. And so that it's kind of understood what the parameters of the litigation is. And in other words, mm -hmm. not that the NGO is taking necessarily taking direction, although maybe maybe they are. I, you can tell me that, but that they are um, trying to send a signal of we have this specific limited goal. We're not trying to do anything bigger. Um, you know, you shouldn't be, you know, we're not trying to do anything that would threaten social stability. Um, wh what have you seen in the way of this kind of backstage collaboration and communication? Uh, yeah, from my, from my uh, understanding or experience with the NGO, I see another side that the NGO can file the cases in a very kind of a proactive way. I mean, not to prepare a long time before they file the cases, but to throw the topic to the government, uh, like, uh, uh, the organizations uh, I have mentioned, these two organizations I have mentioned is really very clear, clearly taking this strategy. And there is another organization, Zhonghua Huanbao Lian He Hui, or China uh, uh, Environmental Federation, which is mm -hmm. a Dungo background. Uh, mm -hmm. That shows so the government, government organized NGO. Yeah. Yeah, government mm -hmm. organization and NGO. That shows a harmony because they are affiliated with government agencies. So they, they handle most of the cases by, the, by NGO. This is another module that they had the, has this close connections and relationship with the government. So they could communicate um, uh, 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 prior uh, the court, uh, I mean, uh, prior the, the whole process started. Mm. And uh, I think another way is I see that some of the NGOs approach public prosecutor like uh, uh, at the very beginning 
to show mm -hmm. that uh, we whether we can collaborate together. And mm -hmm. in private, some of the uh, prosecutors also go to NGOs to ask for information because NGOs has quite different sources of the information to identify the new cases. This is the benefit NGO has. And uh, like I mentioned, there is a quota system inside of the, the prosecutor. So they are worrying about not finding enough the cases or good cases. So they came back um, to the NGOs to consult with them what kind of cases there are. Uh, and if possible, we can collaborate. That happens uh, by individual basis. Yeah. So it's a, it's a, it, I think it's a kind of mixed, um, I mean, uh, I totally understand some NGOs would prepare um, uh, themselves not to surprise local government because of this uh, uh, local protectionism concern. <laughs> and I also do see that NGOs are really acting very uh, proactive, but they are challenged with some difficulties like uh, the, the, the registration <laughs> Um, um, problems with the local government agencies, yeah. Well, in the last few years, the um, Civil Affairs Ministry has been um, mounting a kind of political campaign to clean up so-called illegal yeah. NGOs yeah. Um, yeah, that, and yeah. reduce the number of organizations. Because of course, as we know, the vast majority of nonprofit uh, civil society organizations in China aren't registered at all. Um, <laughs> You know, they're very, very small. They may be two people, three people, and they're not registered. They're very informal. And the civil affairs ministry has been cleaning them up or, you know, saying you can't do this and you must register. Do you have any sense of how many of these um, are environmental in nature and how the extent to which the, the ranks of environmental nonprofit organizations, civil society organizations might actually be shrinking in recent years? Oh. Yeah, that's, a, that's a great question and uh, it's very hard to answer without the statistics. <laughs> um, okay. Yes, yeah, I know that uh, it is happening. And uh, yes, a lot of uh, organizations are registered as a, as a private uh, business, yeah, mm -hmm. rather than the civil, uh, I mean, the, the social organizations because of the registration is really uh, asking for more additional information and process. So that makes uh, the process really very difficult. Um, yeah, to be really frank, I, I do not, uh, I know it is happening. It has a lot of influence or impact on the NGO sector, but I do not have an exact number to, to right. say how many from the environmental organizations. And also I feel uh, by these years, um, because of this in, uh, leadership issue, uh, at the early stage, NGOs are set up uh, because of the uh, individual leaders. So mm -hmm. when the leader are, um, moving on or I mean kind of move to another industries or other business the NGO would disappear so that is also another issue yeah right so another question uh, from the audience is about um, international norms and standards being brought into this litigation so to what extent in these cases are the plaintiffs having reference to um, international standards, uh, whether treaties, whether they're formal treaties or whether they're informal uh, compacts. Um, are these referenced? Are these made part of the argument or is the argument strictly about domestic law? Mm, yeah, there are some uh, um, topics are related to the global issues uh, or may apply uh, with this uh, uh, international standard uh, and uh, treaties like climate, uh, climate change. Uh, one of the cases I know is um, organization sued uh, 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 Hyundai, uh, the, mm -hmm. the automobile, because uh, the, the, the air emission has uh, uh, exceeded the, the standard, local standard. But uh, they sue, they sue uh, the, the, the reason is the argument they, they sue uh, about this company is because they contributed to climate change, with, uh, which uh, kind of reflected to the international standard of the climate change, this is one thing. Um, yeah. Mm. That's, uh, yeah. Yeah, you, you mentioned that um, in your paper um, that I referenced that, that people can download from our website, you said that losing an environmental public interest litigation suit can be very expensive. Yeah. Right, that the NGO 
that brought the suit has incurred all of the court costs. Mm -hmm. And of course, there may be lawyers' fees if the lawyers are not volunteering their services. Um, how often has this happened and have nonprofits, have NGOs that brought lawsuits actually had to fold because they lost a suit? Oh, um, the, uh, the very famous case is about this Changzhou uh, pollution mm. case, which I have uh, discussed just now. Um, the friend of nature is one of the uh, plaintiffs. And uh, if they lost, if they lost the, the case, they had to pay 1.8, uh, 1.89 million as a court fee. Um, so that really worried the, the, the NGO back in 2017, 2018, the whole year, that mm -hmm. it was worry. Uh, but the second court, uh, the, the uh, second trial uh, by the uh, Jiangsu Provincial High Court, uh, judge that uh, the NGO won the case, so they did not need to pay, but that was a concern. Uh, to my best knowledge, uh, I do not know the NGO has, uh, uh, at the end, need to pay this high level of the, of the fee. It's, uh, it did not happen, but, uh, but I know there is a discussion going on to say, to discuss whether the public, uh, public interest, in, interest litigation should only charge by cases, not by the total amount, uh, the, the certain percentage of the amount of the claim. You mean or the court fee? Fee. court fee? Yeah, 50 mm -hmm. to 100 yuan for per uh, case. But mm -hmm. uh, yeah, the, the discussion has two sides. One is, of course, the NGO can benefit from this policy. They do not need, need to really wor worry about this uh, millions of the million, uh, million RMB bill. But another side is uh, whether this uh, policy would encourage uh, the zillions. I mean, mm -hmm. NGO will not feel pressure at all to file the case as many as possible, whether it's uh, reasonable uh, to give this, this freedom to NGO. And, oh, I um, see. Yeah. They would, they would uh, go crazy filing cases if they thought there was no price to pay. Because the cost is really very low. Uh, right. So the discussion about the NGO's case also has shown um, how NGO will choose the case. This is a, mm -hmm. a solid topic for future research as well. Uh, mm -hmm. who, need, you, who needs to be sued, sued? Yeah. Yeah. So we only have a few minutes. I want to ask one last question, and several people have, have raised this as well in the, in the, in the queue, about the, any, whether there's been any impact not specifically on, on, on litigation necessarily, but on China's environmental NGOs from the uh, tw 2017 uh, law that restricted the activities of foreign uh, or overseas uh, nonprofits in China. So under that law, foreign nonprofits and nonprofits from Hong Kong and Taiwan and Macau all have to register either register a permanent office or register their individual activities in China, have the permission of the police mm -hmm. and have an official sponsor. And this has really discouraged um, nonprofits from act operating in China or uh, providing funding for activities in China. Mm -hmm. And um, the general sense is that there's been much less uh, international funding for China's uh, own NGOs because uh, the most famous ones tended to receive a lot of uh, international funding and support. What do you, what impacts do you see in the sector from the 2017 uh, foreign NGO law? Mm. Definitely from the history that the domestic NGOs definitely benefiting from the experiences, expertise and funding uh, brought in by international NGOs, and that uh, really cultivated the sector, the NGO sector growing in, in China. And in 2017, because of the law you have de described just now, really limited uh, the funding and activity and uh, all the efforts in, uh, that the international NGO can bring, bring in. Uh, it does impact a lot, a lot in, uh, with, with domestic NGOs, not only in funding, but also this collaboration and also the, the exchange capacity building um, components has been kind of delayed or, or postponed or canceled even. So that, that, that is uh, really very true. 
happening in China. And uh, for domestic NGOs, uh, they need to find um, different ways to raise funds. And, uh, if we talk about funding was one of the, uh, the concerns. Um, you, you know that uh, uh, there are very few NGOs can be registered as opening opening uh, um, the, 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 the fundraising, open mm -hmm. fundraising NGOs. Uh, so it, it from the public. quite different from the public, yeah. Gongmu, Gongmu, uh, so that is uh, really very difficult. But uh, I know that some NGOs are using the social media and now this with this app to uh, create the, the fundraising activities by individual basis to help them to, to do. And uh, uh, I know, uh, I have an impression like uh, funding from EU can mm -hmm. still <laughs> be mm -hmm. relatively easier than mm -hmm. funding from well, US. Go gov sure. Government funding, of course, is not affected by this law. Mm -hmm. oh, oh yeah, so yeah, definitely. Yeah, mm -hmm. definitely, the government uh, funding is not. So uh, the government funding is uh, part of the, the resources that NGO is facing, but uh, you know, the, when the streamline is getting smaller, uh, mm -hmm. the NGO cannot get much from that. So it's domestic uh, fund, fundraising is one of the focus, uh, mm -hmm. especially the, the uh, uh, foundation law um, mm -hmm. has been passed in 19, uh, uh, 2017 has created some chances that uh, for NGO or foundations to set up to uh, kind of, uh, uh, get the fundings to support domestic NGOs like a C, as the mm -hmm. foundation has uh, supported a lot of environmental NGOs uh, uh, at a grassroots level to grow. And, and uh, yeah, I, I think Alibaba also provide a lot of fundings uh, for the uh, past several years. Mm. So unfortunately, our, we've uh, hit time and we have to stop here, even though we could go on, I think, for quite a while. But uh, uh, Dr. Zhang, thank you so much for this uh, wonderful presentation, uh, given us a lot of food for thought. And um, I also want to tell the audience that on October 13th, we're going to have another program about civil society in China. Um, and the title is The Future of Overseas NGOs in China. So we hope to see you back then. Uh, thank you all for coming and thank you, Dr. Duan. Thank you very much, Catherine. And thank you for the opportunity to share my studies. Thank you.